All right, welcome everyone to today's installment of the CMV web series. Um, just a few housekeeping reminders. Um, first up, we have today's attendance URL and QR code on the screen. Um, you can open up your phone's camera and focus it on the QR image. It should take you to a survey where you can document your attendance today. If you don't want to do that, you can type the, UR, the URL at the bottom of the screen in and get to it that way. And I will paste that URL into the chat um, a few minutes after we get started. Next slide, please. And just a reminder on how to ask questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box. I will be monitoring these questions while Chris is speaking, and if I can answer them um, quickly and easily, I will. And if I cannot, or if I think it's better for Krista to answer for everyone to hear, I will mark them for um, live response at the end. Any unanswered questions will be considered um, for our next webinar next week, which will be completely dedicated to your questions. Um, also, in the weekly reminder email that you receive, there is also a link to a very brief survey where you can put in questions. Um, so be sure to do that so we have a good full hour next week. Um, so with that, I will introduce Crystalise Martin. She is the Associate Chief Scientific Officer at Geisinger, as well as the Professor and the Director of the Autism and Developmental Medicine Institute. And prior to her joining Geisinger, she directed um, clinical genetics laboratories at both Emory University and the University of Chicago. So take it away, Krista. Okay, thanks, Erin. Um, so today we're gonna take a look at uh, the rest of the technical standards outside of the actual scoring metric, which um, the webinar series has been focused on so far. So we're really gonna dive into um, some of the um, <clears throat> interpretation and reporting aspects of the information that was included uh, in this technical standard document. And I know that the title was listed um, as uncoupling CMV classifications. We're going to get into that and actually spend a fair amount of deal, uh, a fair amount of time on that. Um, but we really wanted to bring everything home and wrap everything together of what you've learned on how do we, um, put this information into a report in a way that's understandable to any um, clinician who's ordered a genetic test and specifically related to copy number variants. So just a reminder that um, this guide, uh, technical standard is for constitutional copy number variants and that that's applied to both postnatal and prenatal samples. So for postnatal, um, this is used now as a first tier approach for the evaluation of individuals with intellectual disability, developmental delay, autism spectrum disorder, or uh, and including multiple congenital anomalies. Um, for prenatal right now, um, most of the copy number variant analysis is used in the evaluation of fetuses with structural anomalies that are observed by ultrasound. So, um, Anyone who you know, works routinely with CMV analysis and is analyzing data knows that there are many recurrent CMVs that have now been well characterized, although even for those, um, on some of them, the interpretation is harder than others. But really, most of the CMVs that we run into are unique. And so for that reason, we need um, a way to develop consistent methods that allow for accurate clinical interpretation and appropriate use in clinical care. Um, so we need a, a way to evaluate the genomic content of a particular CMV region and then correlate clinical findings with those that are reported in the medical literature or taking uh, evidence from other available resources together. And as everybody who's participated in this webinar series for the last several weeks knows, we have scoring metrics for both deletions and duplications that take this kind of evidence um, into account for classifying copy number variants with an overall goal of producing consistent and evidence-based clinical classifications um, and reporting across laboratories. And this is all really done in the vein of trying to take better care of patients um, and make take, making, take, making uh, patient care easier for, for clinicians so that what we interpret from the laboratory is clear to both um, our clinicians who've ordered the test and our patients and their families who are receiving the results. So the scoring metrics um, have helped to guide which pieces of evidence that we evaluate and how to weigh those towards classifying any particular CMV. 
And we've spent time going over genomic content, dosage sensitivity, the predicted functional effects, the clinical overlap with patients in the medical literature, how do you apply case control data, and looking at inheritance patterns. And why is this type of standardization important um, as, in looking at evidence and trying to assign points as part of the metric? And really, this comes down to um, that inconsistency among laboratories can easily create confusion for clinicians and patients, leaving them, them unable to confidently use that genetic information to manage their healthcare decisions. And so we don't want one laboratory to call a CMV pathogenic and another to call it uncertain or in the most extreme case, benign. Um, we want you know, the most likely scenario to be that a patient would get the same answer regardless of what laboratory the testing was performed in. And so therefore using consistent terminology in clinical reporting facilitates this unambiguous communication of the clinical significance throughout the medical community. So let's take an example. Um, so let's look at the recurrent 17Q12 deletion um, that we know can cause autism as well as other clinical phenotypes, including uh, renal is issues and maturity onset diabetes of the young. If this deletion were classified as a variant of uncertain significance instead of pathogenic, just because the patient who presented for testing does not have a diagnosis of autism, which as I mentioned is one of the common phenotypes, then they're missing the opportunity to check for some of the other important phenotypes that are observed with this deletion, such as renal issues and diabetes. So a laboratory shouldn't take the standpoint of, I'm going to report this finding as pathogenic if the CNV matches a given phenotype, but if it doesn't match the given phenotype, then I'm not going to report it as pathogenic because my patient's phenotype doesn't match. We all know that this is a pathogenic deletion. It's been well described and well characterized. Um, so it needs to be called such in the care of patients, regardless of whether the patient has all of the phenotypes that are present or reported in that particular deletion. And we know that that's a common um, finding across any type of copy number variant or, or genomic variant in general. We never expect the patients to have all of the features present, and we know that there can be variability between patients, even with the most simple example of individuals with Down syndrome. They all have different risks for different phenotypes, and we would never call Down syndrome uh, trisomy 21 not pathogenic just because a patient didn't have a particular aspect of the phenotype. So it's also important when we classify CMVs to use the now five categories that have been defined for copy number variants. And this was a change from the previous guidelines where there were three categories and variants of uncertain significance were divided uh, into those that were likely pathogenic, benign, or uh, uncertain. We now have aligned with the sequence variant interpretation guidelines to use these five categories of pathogenic, likely pathogenic, a variant of uncertain significance, likely benign, and benign. And these are now the standardized classification categories for uh, both types of genomic variants, sequence variants, as well as copy number variants that should be used as part of clinical care. Um, by using other terms, it only causes confusion for clinicians and families. Um, and you can always provide additional information in the text to further explain the result and how it relates to one of these categories. And we'll uh, go over several examples uh, toward the end of the webinar today to, to talk about that. So here's just one example of why this is important. This is text from an actual clinical report. Um, I've de-identified it and tried not to put headers or things that might make people be able to identify which laboratory this is from because we don't you know, that's not the purpose of this call. The purpose of this call and these uh, standards are to try to align people going forward um, for uh, better and more accurate uh, interpretation across laboratories. But just some things to point out. Um, so in this report, the result only included the ISCN nomenclature for the particular copy number variant. It did not list out any variant classification in a clear and easy way to identify it. Um, in one section of the report, 
um, they reported of um, that this variant was tested in parents and neither of these individuals parents carried the variant that was previously reported to be of unknown clinical significance. Presuming the parents are asymptomatic, they then wrote that this variant is likely to be a disease-associated aberration responsible for this individual's symptoms. But they don't say, is it likely pathogenic or pathogenic? So it's not categorized using one of the consistent terms that is available for using on clinical reports. And then further, in the next section, they go on to provide more details about the loss that was identified by CMA, the size of the deletion, and the number of genes, but then say the significance of this variant is unknown. And although this was a follow-up report, nowhere did it say that we're amending the report, we're updating the report. Um, so here they're, they're saying that is this a variant of uncertain significance? So examples like this, and this one I think is a bit extreme, but I think it's just to make the point that we really need to be better in thinking from the standpoint of who's reading this report we need to be as clear as we can uh, to make it easily readable, consistent, once we make a determination of a classification and stick with the standardized um, terminology that we want people to understand, we want them to use to make it easier to um, incorporate these genetic testing results into patient care. So there's also um, specific CMV reporting criteria that should be incorporated into reporting results from uh, copy number analysis, including the cytogenetic location, um, so chromosome band uh, number and band designation, the size of the CMV and the genomic coordinates. Uh, minimum coordinates are required, but laboratories can also provide maximal coordinates. Um, and importantly, we always need to specify the genome build since we know that this is fluid over time and you need to have the right genome build in order to map exactly where the deletion or duplication is in the genome. Um, the copy number state with the mechanism specifies should be stated if known. So is the, are there zero copies, one copy, two copies, three copies, or more? Is this the result of an interstitial deletion? If it's a duplication, is it because of a marker chromosome. So if additional work has been done to determine the mechanism of the copy number variant, that should be included. And then for intragenic CMVs um, within a gene, they can be described using ISBN if that um, particular CMV was detected via uh, chromosomal microarray, or um, if detected via next generation sequencing, HGBS nomenclature can be used. So there's flexibility um, with how to uh, actually use the nomenclature to describe these. Now there's additional information that should be included um, on the report as well. So laboratories should clarify what um, their criteria are for including CMVs on report. So do they use any type of size of the CMV for including on report? So for example, if a change is less than 250 kilobases, that they would not include those changes on the report unless they're deemed to be disease causing or pathogenic. Um, the classification type, so for example, in prenatal testing, maybe laboratories have developed their test and have their protocol set so that they're only gonna report likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants, but um, may not report benign. Um, and finally, for the classification of the CMV, I think it's important now that we have the metric for how we're looking at the evidence and the different categories of the evidence and providing points to see if that CMV is categorized as pathogenic, likely pathogenic, uncertain, likely benign or benign, that laboratories use that evidence that led to the final classification and put it on the report so that anybody reading the report and trying to see how the interpretation was made has a very easy way to see how many points were assigned, if there's previous cases in the literature, if it's because of case control data, et cetera, but a very simple and easy way to see how the laboratory got to that final classification. I know I've seen many reports um, since the sequencing guidelines have come out 
where it's very nicely outlined um, the various categories that were used to get to a particular classification for a sequence variant makes it really easy to quickly see how the uh, classification and then the interpretation of the finding came together. So here's an example um, of how it's useful to include evidence on the report. So if we take uh, an example of duplication of 22Q11.21, we know that this region includes a gene that has been shown to be triplosensitive. Um, it has a dosage sensitivity score of three through the ClinGen dosage sensitivity uh, evaluation process. And so that information can specifically be listed on the report as evidence for classica classification um, as category 2A, we assigned one point, which means that it's pathogenic. And as I said, anyone reading this clinical report then is able to follow the logic that was used from the person interpreting, uh, interpreting the um, data in evaluating the score and evidence that came up with that final classification. Um, and then just in thinking about other categories um, for reporting criteria, so <clears throat> for prenatal testing, the CMV, both the deletion and duplication metrics and evaluation process should be used in the same manner for both prenatal and postnatal. So we should not change um, or approach the classification of the CMV differently just because the analysis is being done on a prenatal sample. Uh, these are all um, constitutional copy number variants, and so whether it's uh, a sample being tested in the prenatal period or postnatal period should not matter um, as related to the actual classification and clinical significance of the CMD. Um, and as I used an example before, but in particular for prenatal testing, I think it's important that laboratories clearly outline what results they will give back for prenatal samples. So only likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants, or if they're only gonna report variants back that are larger than a specific size threshold, so anything in greater than 500 kilobases or a megabase if they have protocols set and have validated their tests that way, that needs to be clearly um, explained in their test information and on the report as well. So another uh, category of findings that one can come across while doing CMV testing are secondary or incidental findings. Um, and these are findings that are unrelated to the patient's reason for referral, but are deemed to be medically relevant and important, therefore, to make sure that information is relayed back to the patient being tested. Um, just one thing to clarify is that secondary and incidental findings are not the same thing. They're not terms that can be used um, interchangeably. So a secondary finding is one that is included on a particular list, like the ACMG secondary findings list, um, where there was a process that was used to define a list of, um, in our case, genes that would be included in a type of analysis that's additional to the primary analysis. So for the ACMG secondary findings list, which now has 59 genes on it, um, anybody doing CMV analysis then checks for the 59 genes. If there's a deletion or duplication identified, that is the correct mechanism that would has the potential to cause that disease, that um, deletion or duplication should then be reported. And the ACMG secondary findings list um, the current list has been curated by the ClinGen Dosage Sensitivity Curation Working Group. And the web address shown here, which is linked on the clinical, uh, the ClinGen site at clinicalgenome.org, is available so you can see um, what each of those genes scored for deletions or duplication. Um, and then for incidental findings, these are genes or regions that are not included on the current ACMG secondary findings list and are still unrelated to the patient's reason for referral, but are found to have clear medical relevance um, for the patient's care, and that would be important information for them to know. Um, so in these genes, it's recommended that any likely pathogenic or pathogenic CMVs that are identified, so the secondary findings or incidental findings should be reported. 
Um, just a cautionary note, though, is it's important to consider the mechanism for pathogenicity. So it would have to be haploinsufficiency or triplosensitivity for the genes where we're identifying by CMVs. So if that's not a known mechanism for pathogenicity in one of the genes, um, and you can't verify that that would be um, a pathogenic uh, or likely pathogenic CMV, then it doesn't have to be reported. Okay, so now we're going to get into um, the topic of uncoupling CMV classification from the actual clinical presentation of the individual being tested. Um, and this was um, <clears throat> discussed a lot by the working group as we put these technical standards together. Um, and this is currently done for uh, the sequence variant interpretation. So what we're trying to do here is, again, align how we think about genomic variant interpretation, regardless of whether it's a sequence variant or a copy number variant, um, as we move to more unified methods for both um, analyzing and interpreting these different classes of genomic variation. So CMV classification should be performed uh, independent from determining how it contributes to the diagnosis of the individual in whom it is discovered. Um, uncoupling CMV classification from the clinical features reported in the proband is key to be able to objectively and consistently interpret genomic variants. And of course, we need to take the phenotype of the proband into account when we're assessing the evidence that supports the pathogenicity of a CMV but classification should not be solely driven by the presentation of the patient under investigation and whether that patient has a particular phenotype or not. Um, you have to take into consideration all of the available evidence in order to make um, our CMV classification for clinical use. So here's an example just using a generic gene X and disease X. So there's compelling evidence in the literature that deletion of gene X results in disease X. Um, the laboratory evaluating a deletion of this gene by going through the scoring metric is able to reach 0.99 points, which would result in a classification of pathogenic. But the patient who the sample was submitted for does not currently have features of disease X. So in this case, the laboratory should not disregard all of the work they did to look at the evidence that exists in the literature and elsewhere and classify the variant as uncertain solely because the patient did not display features of disease X. This variant is pathogenic. It's, it's known to cause disease or increase risk for disease, and therefore it needs to be called pathogenic on the report. But as I said earlier, then it can be explained uh, in more detail, you know, this patient might not have the features of this disease, um, and how does that relate to the finding? And we'll go through some examples that address this directly. Um, for prenatal CMV interpretation, the same principles as postnatal should be followed. So it's important to remember that we're evaluating the classification of the variant that's uncoupled from the clinical features reported in the prenatal case. And as we all know, you can't ascertain all phenotypes prenatally. So for example, developmental disorders like autism, you know, we could have a normal ultrasound in a pregnancy, um, so we don't see any overt structural defects, but that child could still have a developmental disorder like autism or intellectual disability. Um, but just because of that limitation and not being able to ascertain all phenotypes prenatally, you shouldn't call the variant a variant of uncertain significance based on um, the prenatal phenotype. If the evidence exists that the variant is pathogenic, then the classification for a prenatal case should be pathogenic. So what about X-linked disorders? <clears throat> so if there's a gene on the X chromosome that has substantial evidence for being disease-causing via a loss of function mechanism, we need to think about um, how this uh, relates to the presentation and classification in both males and females. So if we know that there's um, loss of function is a mechanism for pathogenicity, 
then deletions involving this gene should receive a classification of pathogenic. And that would be whether they're observed in hemizygous males with just one X chromosome or heterozygous females with two X chromosomes. Within the report, the laboratory then needs to provide additional information on top of that classification of pathogenic. So they need to explain the potential consequences of such a deletion for the patient under study. <clears throat> for example, in a male proband, the variant could be a diagnostic finding. And in a female proband, it could represent carrier status, but which has obvious risks for reproduction for that female but it could also be an affected female. Uh, for that, you would need clinical correlation to see if that patient had any phenotypic features that were consistent with um, the finding or suggestive of that. But it would still be called a pathogenic deletion in that female. And this is important uh, because we had done a study uh, in 2018, looking at discrepancies in CMV classifications in ClinVar. Um, and variants involving the X chromosome actually represented a significant proportion, almost 20% of conflicts that were flagged that overlapped known dosage sensitive genes. And of these um, CMVs, 85% were due to inconsistencies in the way variants observed in female patients were classified. And that um, extended all the way from benign up through pathogenic. So it, this is why it's important for there to be consistent uh, recommendations as to how different people interpreting the same variant should um, classify these variants. For autosomal recessive disorders, you know, detection of some CMVs, particularly deletions, uh, will indicate carrier status. And these variants should be reported as pathogenic. Remember, we're doing the interpretation based on the variant and what the meaning of the variant is and what the consequences of the variant itself is. You can then provide a further description of the clinical impact of this variant in the person being tested in the report to explain that this was found uh, in an autosomal recessive gene and that two pathogenic variants are needed to cause this recessive disorder, but this patient only has one. Um, if the proband has clinical features, though, consistent with the recessive disorder, then the laboratory should recommend further molecular testing for that specific gene and disorder in an effort to identify the second disease-causing variant. But all we know right now is that there's an individual who has a pathogenic variant, two pathogenic variants are needed, they only have one, so they could just be a carrier, but they also could be affected if there was another pathogenic variant identified. And outlining that in the report should be straightforward so that somebody can read that and understand that there are two pathogenic deletions needed in order to cause that particular disorder. And so it helps in trying to include this information in the report to divide the clinical report into sections. It makes it easier for users of the laboratory to read the report and can also alert them to particular things they need to pay special attention to, such as if particular follow-up is needed. And so for that reason, it's recommended that reports be divided into sections where you can describe the primary variants that are considered relevant to the stated reasons for referral first and separately from other findings, and then describe other variants that could represent secondary findings, incidental findings, carrier status, et cetera. Um, and of course, laboratories can decide what are the best subcategories that they need to put on their reports as needed, but these are just suggestions of basic categories um, to help standardize information that's included on a report to make it easier to read across laboratories. Um, so in the recommendation for appropriate clinical follow-up, the laboratory should include recommendations for any necessary further cytogenetic characterization of the CMV if needed, uh, the need for genetic counseling to help the family understand the meaning of the finding and what additional, um, if any, work needs to be done, the evaluation of relevant family members, 
um, to aid in any interpretation of the copy number variant. And then in the case of variants of uncertain significance, it's always important to um, recommend that continued surveillance of the medical literature and variant databases of the CMV should be carried out. Um, and this is now done, you know, as, as we delve more into exomes and um, more genome-wide analyses, a lot of laboratories are offering this follow-up reanalysis on a more regular basis. Okay, so we're um, now going to shift gears and go through some example reports and see how some of the recommendations that were introduced in the technical standards document can be applied um, through, um, through example reports. And we particularly um, left the, the information in these re reports pretty generic because we didn't want to necessarily focus on the evidence in this part of the webinar. We really want to focus on how the information is presented and how you can make it more clear about the variant interpretation um, and clinical phenotypes and what really the take-home message should be for the um, ordering user of the test. So we'll start simple. Um, so case one is a single CMV as the diagnosis. And for this case, we have uh, the reason for referral is Jane Doe is a nine-year-old female who was referred for a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. We identified a pathogenic deletion involving 10 genes, including gene X. And we know that loss of function variants in gene X have been identified in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorder, such as developmental delay, intellectual disability, and autism. Um, this finding is believed to be causative of this individual's clinical findings and genetic counseling is recommended. So we've clearly included our classification of pathogenic using the ACMG and ClinGen recommended term um, right up in front where it's uh, visible. And then we can provide further details uh, down below. Oops, sorry. Um, so here we provide the detail of the actual uh, copy number variant, including the ISC and nomenclature, the type of CMV, the size, the inheritance pattern, um, the zygosity, and our classification again. And then here you can go over more relevant genomic content. So that gene X we know is related to neurodevelopmental disorders with a mode of inheritance that's autosomal dominant. This finding is related to our reason for referral and causative for uh, this patient's phenotype. And you can even, you know, in a third tier, provide more information about gene X and its relationship to neurodevelopmental disorders, what uh, references are, you know, provide useful references from the literature. And then here's where you may put that more detailed information of how you um, came to um, call this pathogenic by working through the deletion metric um, that's done as part of this interpretation. So for case two, um, this is one where we did not find anything related to the patient's reason for referral, but we did find an incidental finding. And so again, we have our patient Jane. She's nine years old, referred for a developmental delay and autism spectrum disorder. We state right up front that this test did not identify any variants that can explain the patient's reported clinical features. However, we did find a pathogenic deletion um, involving gene Y, and that loss of function variants in gene Y have been identified in individuals with autosomal dominant progressive sensoroneural sensor hearing loss. We go on further to say that Jane was not reported to have hearing loss, so this CMV may represent an incidental finding, or it could be a cause for a phenotype that was just not reported to the laboratory or may be observed in the future and clinical correlation genetic counseling are recommended. So just like in the previous report, of course, providing more of the detailed um, genomic information, coming down to the genomic content, <clears throat> explaining that the gene Y is known to cause uh, sense, uh, pr progressive hearing loss uh, in an autosomal dominant manner. This is an incidental finding, so it's not what we are testing. We don't have an information about her um, actual uh, status of hearing. Um, 
So we say though she was not reported to have hearing loss to us, that she's thought to be at risk to develop this given this finding. Uh, and again, clinical correlation genetic counseling are recommended. <clears throat> and then again, the more detailed description. And the other thing I didn't mention on the previous one is, you know, depending on the size of the CMV, many laboratories will list all of the other genes. Of course, you're not going to do that for something that's 10 megabases, but for some of the smaller ones, it may be prudent to list all of the genes in that interval. What about a case that we only identified carrier status? So here, again, Jane <clears throat> was referred for developmental delay in autism. Right up front, we say we did not find any variants that can explain this patient's phenotype. However, uh, we did find a pathogenic deletion of gene Z that is associated with an autosomal recessive condition. And this indicates that Jane is at least a carrier for disease one because she has one pathogenic uh, copy number variant. And then go on to further annotate that this variant alone is insufficient because it's an autosomal recessive disease. Clinical correlation is recommended. And if warranted, and again, this would largely be based on if Jane has a phenotype that may match that autosomal recessive disorder, that one could consider additional testing to determine a genetic uh, etiology um, related to see if she has a second variant related to the autosomal recessive disorder, or also because we didn't find anything related um, to her reason for referral, if any additional testing would be done um, to try and figure out the cause for that. So here in our table of relevant genomic content, we again reiterate the gene that it's autosomal recessive and that it's insufficient to cause disease, that you would need a second pathogenic variant in trans in order to cause disease. And that this finding alone does not explain uh, the patient's reported phenotype for which the test was referred. Okay. Now we're going to get a little more complex because, as we all know, um, doing CMV analysis, most CMVs have more than one gene, and those genes can all have different uh, links to disease. So here's a CMV with multiple genes. We have a single gene that is the diagnosis with two additional genes um, that both have pathogenic findings but are unrelated to the reason the patient was referred. So again, we have Jane, who's a nine-year-old female referred for autism spectrum disorder. We found a pathogenic 1.4 megabase deletion, including gene X, and we know that heterozygous loss of function variants in gene X have been identified in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders. And this finding is causative of this individual's clinical findings. So pathogenic and um, for the reason for referral. But we also found in this copy number variant that there was gene Y. And heterozygous loss of function variants in gene Y are known to cause autosomal dominant progressive hearing loss. The laboratory did not have any information provided to them about Jane's hearing. So it could be an incidental finding or could provide a cause for a phenotype either not reported to the lab or that might be observed in the future. And then finally, a third gene in that same CMV includes uh, is gene Z. And we know that by allelic loss of function variants in gene Z have been identified in individuals with disease one, which is an autosomal recessive condition. So we know that Jane is at least a carrier because she has a pathogenic um, change in this gene, um, but it's insufficient to cause disease one. Therefore, clinical correlation is recommended to determine if additional testing to identify a second pathogenic variant in gene Z is warranted. With then the descriptor of um, the CMV here, and our table gets a little longer here, but it's easy to provide additional information related to why the CMV is called pathogenic and how the various findings may relate to um, our patient's phenotype. So gene X, is related to the reason for referral. Um, it's pathogenic, thought to be causative for the reported uh, autism that's present in this patient. Gene Y that causes hearing loss 
is an incidental finding. Jane wasn't reported to have hearing loss, but could be at risk, or maybe we just didn't uh, know that she had hearing loss because it wasn't reported in the laboratory. And finally, in gene Z, which is an autosomal recessive disorder, Jane is at least a carrier since she only has one pathogenic variant, um, and she would need a second to, in order to cause an autosomal recessive disease. And then, as with the previous ones, more information about each of those genes can be provided um, for the um, individuals who ordered the test so that you can give useful references for those phenotypes. Okay, case five is copy number variant with multiple genes. So where we have a single gene that's pathogenic in the CMV region, and this is an incidental finding, but there's an additional gene in that same CMV region that has an unclear relationship to the reason for the referral. So here, um, our reason for referral, again, is autism spectrum disorder. We did not identify any variants that can explain the patient's reported clinical features at this time. But we did find a pathogenic deletion um, of 3Q and 1.2, including gene X. And we know that heterozygous loss of function variants in gene X have been in, uh, identified in individuals with breast and ovarian cancer. So at this time, Jane was not reported to have cancer, but this may represents an incidental finding. So it's a finding that's not on the ACMG, it's a gene that's not on the ACMG secondary finding list. So it's an incidental finding. Um, and it could uh, cause a phenotype that either was not reported to us or that could be observed in the future. That same CMV also includes, um, that is a deletion, also includes gene Y. Um, at this time, there's no evidence um, strong evidence for gene Y being causative of a particular disease, but there are some reports in the literature. There are two individuals with intellectual disability, um, but the information provided when we worked through the scoring metric for deletion uh, did not come up with enough evidence to assign this gene uh, to be disease causing and likely linked to Jane's referral for autism spectrum disorder. So at this time, there's insufficient evidence to say with certainty that loss of this gene is a cause for Jane Doe's autism. So again, down in the table, more information can be provided that we have a pathogenic CMV because of an incidental finding in gene X. Jane was not reported to have this phenotype, um, but she's at risk uh, for breast or ovarian cancer because of this pathogenic variant in that gene. And then related to her reason for referral, there was a gene in the region that has had a few cases reported, a couple, two cases reported, um, but with insufficient evidence to confirm a relationship between the loss of that gene and a neurodevelopmental disorder. So at this time, that finding is not believed to be causative. Um, and people um, taking care of Jane should consider to, to do additional testing to investigate other genetic etiologies or follow this gene over time. Um, you can then provide more information, uh, just going back through you know, a reminder of how you evaluate evidence in the literature for some of these um, single genes. So in this particular case, there were two unrelated individuals that had intellectual disability. Both variants were identified following Sanger sequencing, so they haven't you know, sequenced the rest of the genome, only this gene. Um, the variant in the first proband, the, there was no inheritance information available. Um, in the second, the authors report individual had negative fragile X, so previous testing. The variant was shown to be de novo, but it's also present in six out of one, two, three, four, five, six alleles uh, in NOMAD. So not evident, these aren't pieces of evidence that would get up, us up to have any, um, support any relationship with uh, autism spectrum disorder at this time. And of course, the assessment could change over time as we learn new information about that gene. Okay, so case six uh, and seven are both going to be related to CNVs with low penetrance and variable expressivity. So the first case 
uh, is a pathogenic CMV that has low penetrance and variable expressivity that is related to the reason for referral. Um, and here, again, we have Jane referred for developmental delay in autism. We found a pathogenic duplication of 22Q11.21. The duplication uses breakpoints A to D is about 2.5 megabases in size and corresponds to the recurrent 22Q11.2 proximal region. We know that duplications of this region are associated with low penetrance and variable expressivity, and that they've been observed in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, as well as in apparently normal individuals, even within the same family. And we point out that this duplication is contributing to Jane Doe's reported phenotype. So then, uh, in, again, in a table providing a little more detail, the relevance category is related to the reason for referral, but there is low penetrance and variable expressivity, um, and that clinical correlation is recommended um, for this patient. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here is that ClinGen has established a low penetrance working group um, that is currently working on defining additional descriptors such as low penetrance um, that can be added with the five primary classification categories so that you may call a variant pathogenic, comma, low penetrance. Um, and this actually reminds me too that, you know, the initial technical standards for copy number variants were really set as a starting point for trying to standardize CMV interpretation. We fully expect, and as you see here, we've already started to develop additional working groups to annotate and improve, or continue to annotate and improve our methods for how we can describe CMVs as we learn more about genomic variants, uh, and then also can just figure out better methods um, of how, how to interpret and standardize uh, the interpretation of CMVs over time. So, you know, we encourage feedback from people using these guidelines. Our committee continues to talk about what else we need to focus on uh, and this low penetrance working group is just one example of how we continue to iterate uh, on the, on the um, technical standards to improve them and make them more applicable across all of the various complex types of genomic variants that we see in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, the final case, case seven, again, uh, is a pathogenic CMV with low penetrance and variable expressivity but now this is unrelated to the reason for referral. So here we have Jane presenting again with hearing loss as her reason for referral. And we're gonna state that this test did not identify any variants that it can explain the patient's reported clinical features for referral. Um, but a pathogenic duplication of 22Q11.21 was identified. Go on to explain that the size corresponds to the current region um, and that duplications of this region are associated with low penetrance and variable expressivity, that they've been observed in individuals with NDDs as well as in apparently normal individuals even within the same family. And we can then link back Jane's information to this pathogenic duplication. Jane was not reported to have features of neurodevelopmental disorder, so therefore, this finding could be an incidental finding or a cause for a phenotype that was not reported to the laboratory. So this finding does not mean that Jane has a specific neurodevelopmental disorder, such as autism. Those diagnoses are made based on clinical presentation. Um, it just means that she has a pathogenic duplication of 22Q11.21, and that clinical correlation is recommended to determine the significance of this variant in her and her family. Uh, that's further delineated down here where we outline the duplication, uh, state that it's not related to the reason for referral, that we know that this is a region uh, of copy number variation that is associated with low penetrance and variable expressivity, um, and that clinical correlation is recommended to determine if additional testing is warranted in this individual. So that's the last case we are gonna review. Um, this is, again, the, for the attendance URL and, and the QR code. So to, if people did not, weren't on or didn't scan this at the beginning of the webinar, to please uh, take a picture 
with your cell phone uh, and go and fill out the information requested uh, at this URL. And with that, uh, we'll stop and we'll try to take questions if there are any. Thank you. Yep, we have a bunch of questions. Thanks, Krista. And again, um, if you have put your question in the q and I will have a log on of it. And if we don't get to it today, we can get to it next week. Um, so the first question that came in, um, thank you for clearly stating that secondary and incidental findings are not the same thing. Um, are they mutually exclusive? And then the person asked, you know, is, is it different for CMVs or for sequence? Variants, but I think the main gist of the question is are the two things mutually exclusive secondary findings versus incidental findings? Yeah, so I think if I mean if a gene is on the secondary findings list, I wouldn't ever call it incidental. So in that regard, they would be is mm -hmm. that answer the question? They would be mutually ex exclusive. Um, that the first definition used should be the secondary finding definition. And if a gene is on a list that is particularly, has been designed to interrogate, uh, a, you know, uh, <laughs> results during a clinical test, and you find something in one of those genes, you should first call it a secondary finding. Um, so, yeah, I would never call a gene on the secondary findings list an incidental finding. Okay, and that's fair to say of both CMVs and sequence variants, right? Um, yes, yeah, I think so. I can't think of okay. any reason why it wouldn't be. Okay, great. All right, next question. So do you think classification of a CMV is also decoupled from the genetic background in addition to the patient's phenotype? And what we mean by genetic background here is other variants detected in the given genome. These variants could be either CMVs or sequence variants, um, genetic background of the focal CMV that is being considered in the focal patient, if that makes sense. So, so the question is, if you had a primary CMV in a person, but then another CMV, would you put those CMVs together for interpreting? I, I think that's the question, and SGI, um, if you would like to clarify that in any comments, that would be great. Um, but I guess, I guess you know, thinking of one example of this is like, you know, the autosomal recessive example. Like, if you just mm -hmm. found a deletion of an autosomal recessive gene, would you call that anything right. other than pathogenic, even if you didn't know that there was another variant on the other allele? Right, yeah, and I think, you you take the genomic variants independently for your characterization, um, just as you would take two autosomal recessive variants independently. Um, and then in, in the relationship to the actual patient phenotype is when you think about how could these two variants act together to produce a phenotype in the patient. You know, in an autosomal recessive disorder, having two pathogenic variants causes a disease or in the case of two CNVs from two different regions of the genome, you know, one might be large enough to cause an effect. Having another 10 megabase deletion on top of that might make that patient's phenotype more severe than what you would see if that patient only had the first CNV. All right, and they did type in an additional cl uh, clarification, which is, does the classification of a variant, no matter what it is, CMV or sequence variant, change based on what other variants are present in that genome. And I think your, your example case that you showed that did have a recessive variant um, was a good one for that. I mean, just like if you did a carrier screen and you, you know, on parents about to have a baby or something and one of the parents had a, or a carrier screen and you found one variant, you would still call that variant pathogenic, but then That's you would right. go on to explain this doesn't by itself cause any disease. This means you're a carrier and et cetera, et cetera, what this means. Right. And I think that brings up an important point. I mean, it is a shift, you know, um, to call, well, I think it's a shift for people doing CMV analysis to call a heterozygous deletion like that, um, that you know is an autosomal recessive gene pathogenic. When we know right now, all we know is it's at least a carrier. But again, that really aligns with the sequence inf uh, interpretation, sequence variant interpretation guidelines, that you're looking at the variant independently. 
And your first step is what are you going to classify that variant as based on the evidence that exists around that variant? And then what, how does that variant and its classification relate to the patient? Okay, next question. Um, should all pathogenic autosomal recessive variants be reported, especially in prenatal cases? Um, so, one thing, um, I, I saw this question flip up on my screen when we were talking and I, I was thinking about it. Um, one thing that the committee did discuss is if you have, say, a 50 megabase deletion, do you have to put every autosomal recessive gene on that 50 megabase deletion, or do you point out that there could be autosomal recessive genes in there? Um, and Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think we lean towards, you know, we don't expect laboratories to list out all autosomal recessive genes. Now that's getting easier and easier with bioinformatics and tools to, to pull that information out for reporting purposes. But that was the guidance set forth is that that's not the expectation here. But if there is a well-known disease, autosomal recessive disease that's included in the smaller CMB, then calling that out is important. And I think just getting back to the prenatal part of the question, that goes back to what you said about the lab just needs to decide what they're going to do and state it very clearly. So if your yeah. lab has decided we are not returning autosomal recessive carrier status in prenatal cases, I think that's fine. You just need to say that so everybody is clear that that's what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. We got a couple of questions. I'm trying to combine two questions here. Um, the first one is, it, it, they essentially boil down to like, what do you say when you don't know anything about the patient's phenotype? So the first question was, what sentence would you use instead of consistent with phenotype for a prenatal case, which, you know, the phenotype can't be confirmed prenatally? Or somebody else asked later on, if you just simply didn't get any information about your patient, like, how do you, um, or, you know, what do you do? We, we showed some examples where things were neatly classified into this is related to the reason for referral mm -hmm. and this maybe mm -hmm. isn't. So if you don't know what that reason for referral is, then maybe what could you think about doing? Then shame on the people who referred the test <laughs> for not providing it. Then <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that. Um, no, I mean, I think, you know, first and foremost, saying what the variant is, is important. Um, so saying the variant is pathogenic for what particular disease or um, what particular disease, then in that case, I think if you don't have any information of the patient, you could say no information was uh, provided to the laboratory at the time of testing. We tried to get that information and couldn't get it, and clinical confirmation is needed. But regardless, okay. that variant is still pathogenic. That's not going to change based on the patient phenotype. It's just how is that information interpreted along with the presentation of the patient. Okay. And Krista, would you flip back to really any one of your examples? Someone is asking, don't you need to put what disease the variant is pathogenic for? Um, oh. And do you cite ClinVar and or papers? And the person was specifically asking, like, do you need to put the disease closer to the word pathogenic? Um, and so I'll just point out here, like up in the top of the report summary, yeah. where it says, however, a pathogenic 1.4 megabase deletion, blah, 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 blah. The very next sentence says heterozygous loss of function variants in gene X have been identified in blah, 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 blah disease. Then we say it again in the table at the bottom. So yes, you do need to specify um, which gene you're talking, I mean, what disease that you're talking about. And then where might you cite ClinVar and or other papers? Maybe um, the next slide. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so here I just uh, we just put in a generic reference one. If you look under that um, uh, description of gene Y, again, just because these are generic examples and not to like muddy the waters with real information, but like, you know, where I put reference one, that, you know, that's just an example of, yes, please do cite all of your your references, and if you use ClinVar, cite that as, as well. Just be very clear with where you got your information. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, for this analysis, so last question, for this analysis, do you refer to RefSeq genes only or any ensemble UCSC ACE genes? 
what or what resources can be clinically used for clinical reporting, like NOMAD, ClinVar mm -hmm. dosage map with Cipher, any other web databases, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, all of those resources are available. I think it's up to the discretion of the individual laboratories as to build their policies for what information they feel confident enough to use as part of their clinical interpretation. Certainly all of those could be used and I think, um, you know, based on your assessment of them, uh, knowing where the data came from, the quality of the data is how you should interpret for your laboratory what information you want to use for your final clinical interpretation. Remembering that this is clinical reporting and some of the resources that exist don't document where they got the information from um, and so you want to be sure that you feel very confident in the data that you're utilizing for this clinical reporting process. All right. Well, that is the end of our time today. Um, next week is our final installment of the web series, and it will be dedicated to questions and answers. Um, Fen, I was just trying to quickly type you a note before we hung up. I'm sorry, I accidentally dismissed your question, um, but if you send it to me again, I'll answer it for you. I'm sorry. Um, otherwise, we might answer it next week. Um, so we will talk again in a week. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. And Erin, can you print the questions out for me, the ones you guys answer online, so I can take a look at them, yep. too? Okay, great. I can. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.